Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Recovery Room. So we're on episode two, season three, back with the brand new look. And we're loving it, guys, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I love it. You guys are great. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so firstly, appreciate you all coming, speaking to the community. And uh, Drew, um, you picked the topic this week. Tell me the reason behind it and what you wanted to get out of this chat. And then I can give you some good information on the sort of questions that we got based on the topic, which I found really interesting. I, I'm going to defer to Miss Quinley because I think it was actually her topic. Oh, was yeah. it? Sorry, Kim. Kim, yeah. you go. <laughs> no, no. I thought it, this. I I constantly get asked about people's doubt around their diagnosis, doubt around how, what it, what anxiety is and what it what it should look like. And so I was really excited. This is the topic for the day. So doubt, so someone in an anxiety disorder doubting that they're in an anxiety disorder or someone who gets regular anxiety uh, doubting that it's reg just regular anxiety? Both, but often they're doubting, is this really anxiety or is this a symptom of a bigger problem? Is so you mean like health anxiety, thinking the physical symptoms are something worse? Could be, it could be doubt around an obsession that they have is this really OCD or am I really a terrible person or am I a, a killer or pedophile or whatever it may be um, mm -hmm. it could also be just doubting like what uh, to what degree should I be functioning and doubting their diagnosis maybe even being told that that it, you know you're fine you haven't got any problem when really you do mm, definitely how do you guys feel about that? Someone turning around and tell, telling someone who's got an anxiety disorder that they're fine, there's no problem. Uh, Josh, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, an anxiety disorder is a problem, um, but that's why psychoeducation is so important. Um, however, how your anxiety presents, your OC, if you've got OCD, how that presents, you know, it's important to know what's helpful and what isn't. I mean, if I've got conventional anxiety about something, reassurance is fantastic. You know, like, am I going to be okay, guys? This job interview going to be all right? Yeah, you know, you can nail it. You're the best. I'm like, Thanks. You know, that's really helpful. It, you know, you can internalize that. But that's with, a really with, good point, that Josh. Um, saying that with conventional anxiety, that reassurance is actually not a bad thing. That, that's actually really interesting. Not at all. And that's why it's really important to distinguish between what the difference is. But with certain presentations, as as, as Kim knows, and, and, and well, you, you guys know that you can get stuck in a trap of disordered anxiety, where what unites them all is a disordered threat response that's firing off. And that's when we don't take that seriously ultimately in one sentence you overcome disordered anxiety when you tell the disordered threat response that it isn't needed and then therefore we use our behavior which is pretty much the foundation of kind of like erp and stuff where it's a bit like no we're going to do we're, we're going to teach this threat response it isn't needed by doing this uh, and therefore that's when you've got to say like actually reassurance and stuff like that isn't good because you're taking you're taking it seriously <laughs> and, you know an alarm that shouldn't be going off Drew, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I probably, when I named the topic, I may have slightly misinterpreted, Kim, when you were after. Uh, I understand, but that makes good sense. There's even more wrinkles. For me, I always hear, the question I always get is, but how can I be sure that it's just anxiety? Mm -hmm. How can I be sure that I'm not actually going to act on these intrusive thoughts? Or how can I be sure that I'm not really going to die, have a heart attack? Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear all the time. So I think it's a combination. The doubt happens there too. Like, am I really safe? Because, you know, like Josh was saying, that misfiring threat response will constantly whisper that like, well, this time you might not be safe. It's really, this is real. Like you're not really safe. And then they doubt, you know, they doubt that a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's- that I think people don't realize that that's an intrusive thought as well. I think there's a misconception that intrusive thoughts, so I'm going to kill my mother or I'm going to sleep with a, a family member or whatever. They don't actually realize that an intrusive thought has so many broad, different meanings. Um, Kim, I don't know if you want to just, I know there's thousands upon thousands out there, but if you just want to name a few that people might not realize are actually intrusive thoughts when they are. Right. I think one of the most common is the doubt, is like, the, like no, Drew, I think you perfectly titled it, is how can I be sure that it's only 
anxiety. It's own, how can I be sure it's only OCD, right? Um, another a common one is like, is this a, a lot of com, often I get asked the question, is this normal for, for anxiety? Is this normal? And that's coming from a doubt of like, are you sure it's not anxiety? Now, in terms of intrusive thoughts, there are so many different ways intrusive thoughts can show up. I, a few months ago, I did a post that where I um, on Instagram of where I just got everybody's example of an intrusive thought and put a post together. And some were like, what if thoughts? Some were, are you sure thoughts? Some were actually like worst case scenario thoughts, like you want to hurt your family, right? So it oh. could be in that way as well. So intrusive thoughts can show up in so many ways. Probably one of the most common is how can I be so sure, certain that this is anxiety and that it's not a sign of a deeper, darker um, secret or denial or whatever it might be they may have been told. No, that, that makes total sense. Um, and often, yeah, often people, when they look at intrusive thoughts, they, they start to worry that they're actually get, gaining these, these thoughts and believe, start to maybe um, go down the rabbit hole with the false narrative that why like why are they thinking this way does it mean that there's something wrong with them that way uh josh have you ever come across that in the therapy room or anything yeah, yeah i come across it a lot um the, i mean in my personal opinion this is why some people don't do this i do this kim might kill me for doing this <laughs> i often find like ocd and anxiety disorders are just part of the same ugly multi-pack of crisps it's a bit like kind of <laughs> that that sentence links them both, doesn't it? It's like for an anxiety disorder, like panic disorder, it would be like, or health anxiety. But like, what I hear is, what if it? it okay, I'm convinced it's anxiety, but what if it's anxiety plus something else? Mm. All right, I'm convinced that this is anxiety, but what if it's anxiety and this intrusive thought means I want to drown my children? What if this? Is, so it not only is how do I know? Can so it's oh yeah, how can I be sure it's only anxiety? Well, the universal factor is that it's doubt. You know, I usually have a checklist for people. Obviously, don't let it become a serious compulsion. But like for most people, it helps with like check one, do you feel scared? Yes. Check two, full of doubt. Yeah. Check three, if you probably have this thought or something before, and you know it's anxiety. Yeah. What if you check this? Leave it now. If it's gone, you know, and they're like, oh, a tool that I use personally, um, because I know I, I know what it feels like to be hit by that doubt. Like, oh, my God, no, this this time it feels different because all my oh. symptoms are different. And I'm sure you've had that, Drew, where it's like oh. I've had a panic attack in the past where the symptoms are completely different from another panic attack. So I'm like, well, maybe this isn't a panic attack. Yeah. This time I feel sick, whereas last time I felt dissociated, you know, and it's like. But the universal factor is the doubt. So your three checklists. Do I feel scared? Yes. Well, then you know it's an anxious response. You know it's anxiety if you feel scared. You can't feel scared. You can't have anxiety without you know feeling scared and vice versa. Do you feel doubt? Yes, of course you do. And is this kind of similar to what you've had before? It is. It's not exactly the same, but it is very similar. So I'm going to go with this three checklist. Take my 99% and go with that. Even when, even when... Sorry, uh, Drew. Right. I was just going to say, even when the symptoms are practically identical it's the body's um responsibility to make it feel that it is different this time because it's trying to trick you that you're in a dangerous situation right um so every single time that you get a panic attack every single time that you feel anxious you're gonna feel that you're you're in a danger because that's it is your body working correctly yeah i mean it 100 percent is like it's that thing where the threat response is really easy to turn on, but really hard to turn off by design. Like it should be that way to keep us safe. But I, I think one of the toughest things, Josh, and your checklist is really good. The third one is always the doubt. Like, you know, that the, the doubt, because the doubt overwhelms all the stuff on the checklist. And so one of the things that I tell people all the time when they ask, but how can I be sure? Or how can I, how can I convince my brain that it's just anxiety? That I, I, why can't I get this? The answer is you can never be 100% sure. That's the answer that everybody hates. Like, you can never be 100% sure. Is there a 0.5% chance that it's not anxiety this time? Yeah, that's that could be. But 
we don't get 100% in anything in life. And so that's a tough one. And I, when you go down the rabbit hole of trying so desperately to be 100% sure, it just it just pours gas on the flames because you can't get the certainty and it feels even more dangerous and that cycle just spins out of control. So the doubt overwhelms so much of everything. I just wanted to raise some um, that I've seen on social media, uh, unfortunately on Instagram, which is a lot of people are falling down the rabbit hole of thinking that anxiety recovery means that they'll never deal with a panic attack um, again or they'll never feel anxious again. And the major reason that the that I hear that the the fear in this is because of the things that they're being told by the people that they're seeking help from. Um, do you think that's a a beneficial way of of talking about anxiety recovery and anxiety cure? Look, look at Dean loading up that question as if it's impartial. He knows <laughs> exactly what we're going to say. Though. <laughs> it's like a Jerry Springer show of anxiety recovery. Look at Dean like. <laughs> 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 I've heard in therapists who aren't informed of anxiety disorders that panic attacks are proof that the trauma hasn't been uncovered yet. And I'm like, oh, just shoot me now. Just shoot me in the face and get it over and done with. Because it's like, it's so, that narrative is so harmful for like anxiety disorders and OCD. It's not when people don't have that. And if there is something that you want to uncover, I do believe that there's a, you know, there's a big place for that. I've had people come to me think, and they've internalized a message that where even the therapist has become frustrated with them because they keep getting panic attacks mm. because of this narrative that they have to find the, you know, the roots or whatever it is to it. And like, no, they're just in a cycle of fearing fear and misinterpreting the threat response. Um, and yeah, I think that those narratives can even happen in therapy. Never mind the idiots that you see online. Like, no, nah, I won't. I won't name them. Wait, like, <laughs> oh, so close! I was <laughs> They're like, I'll get you a hundred percent anxiety free. Just follow my program. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that those narratives don't are really harmful. Well, a hundred percent anxiety free is harmful. In, just living it's as dead. a human, right? It's, you're right. It's dead. hundred percent anxiety free when you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I will go as far as saying I will I will extend on that is and my own frustration lately is the so how many accounts even pathologize normal degrees of suffering. We all suffer. We're all gonna have sadness, we're all gonna have grief, we're all gonna have anxiety. And the, I feel like there's this influx of people who are even pathologizing normal suffering. We all suffer. We're going to suffer. This idea of like, you know, there's this, this um, reel that's like um, about being healed or unhealed as if when you're healed, you feel nothing but joy all the time. And I feel that that is so problematic even for those who don't have an anxiety disorder, is to preach this idea that we're supposed to be healed and not feel any negative emotion, that's a massive problem in my mind. Yeah, it's horrible. That's why that's I like the, the book, The Happiness Trap. That's a good book. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a great book. Yeah. Uh, that's the, uh, not uh, Reed Wilson. Kelly Wilson wrote Things Can Go Horribly, Terribly Wrong. And yeah. that's the Russ big, Harris. Yeah, a big part of that was also the, uh, like, hey, look, we all suffer. This is part of this. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Guys, I want to get on to a few of the audience questions. Um, I will say a lot of them are anxiety symptom related, but I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, I think there might have been like a miscommunication with the audience and the topic, but we'll try our best. <clears throat> um, can you tell me the difference uh, between HSP and BPD? First question. Oh, oh boy. Right. Josh. 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 <laughs> Let's just sit back and listen to Josh. <laughs> Open a beer and let Josh go on this. Well, no. I'll jump in. I'll jump in first. Please. Okay. <laughs> Borderline personality disorder is in the DSM, whereas highly sensitive person is not. So let's just first start with that having borderline personality disorder is a legit mental health disorder. 
Um, it is a men mental and a medical disorder. We would treat it with medication if someone was struggling. Um, but when we're looking at borderline, we're mostly looking at somebody who, you know, generally struggles a lot with suicidal ideation, many attempts, struggles to regulate their emotions, has a difficult time managing relationships when they're feeling those, those um, strong emotions. Does that mean that they can't be a fully functioning adult? Absolutely not. There are so many amazing people out there who've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder who are you know, wonderful, thriving people, but they do need to usually go through the, the gold standard treatment for borderline is uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. So I'll let Josh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so not to echo what Kim says, but yeah, BPD is, is, a, is a thing where, where actually you can have a therapeutic and medical intervention. Um, highly sensitive people. Um, Come on, bring it. So a HSP, a highly sensitive person, is a term derived, but I can't remember the author, I've repressed that, um, is a term derived for, for people who are highly empathetic and sensitive to other people around them. Maybe they're very empathetic. Maybe they um, are very attuned to people's facial expressions and stuff like that ultimately it's a fancy word for i have slight social anxiety i have attachment issues and i get anxious also i'm really highly empathetic but you know what i'm going to do i'm going to ball all four of those things together write a book on it sell thousands and make loads and have people pinning hsp badges on them it's just a word to say that you're empathetic and sensitive it's just a not unnecessary word it means nothing. I read the book and you know what? The whole book applied to me and I still reject the label because I think it's ridiculous. Um, but if you like that, then you go for it. I ain't going to judge you. But if you want to be miserable like me, it's not needed. Um, it's a clever, it's a clever thing. I might do it. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like, do you struggle with what ifs? Do you struggle with doubt? Do you know, do you argue with people you love? Yeah. You're a JSP. You're a Josh sensitive person. Buy my five books on JSPs because you'll relate to it. It'll give you a sense of belonging and I can get rich. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> and, and let me add, when I first read about highly sensitive people, I actually was like, this does describe me very, very well. But where I found as a clinician, there is a concern. I think if you want to call yourself a HSP, I don't think there's a problem. But where I do struggle is where people will then say, I can't do that because I'm a HSP. I can't face my fears because I am, right? And so I, I wouldn't, you know, I get very easily overwhelmed in social settings. I, I'm an emotional person, but I, I try not to use labels that keep me stuck in those behaviors. I, tr if that, if the label keeps me stuck, I try not to use it. Just give me one second here. A little housekeeping, the pounding, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm a little bit angry right now because mm -hmm. the pounding of the anxiety is a choice. Get off the couch and move. I'm going to boot you. I don't, I can't tell who you are because it only tells me Facebook user. But that is exactly not the kind of help that we want to give out. All right. 100%. So there, there may be some validity underneath that, but just hammering at somebody again and again is ham handed and misunderstanding. So that's not OK. All right. So you're welcome to stay. But enough with that. OK. Hammering somebody that way is never going to be OK in this environment. Just Perfect. there you go. Unless you wrote a book on HSPs. Yeah, and then in which case, go ahead. Right, uh, that, that leads me on to the next question. Uh, Drew, if you want to start off with this one. Sure. Um, can Can you trust your gut even if you don't have a clean bill of health, but you know it's anxiety? Oh, good question. You know, and that's a complicated question. It's a reasonable question to ask, too, because a lot of people deal with this stuff, and there are also real medical concerns. I get that. So it adds more doubt. There's no doubt about that, I think. But can you trust your gut? I think in the end, you have to start to really, you got to try to work on erring on the side of, let me just put a pause in and see how this plays out. All right. So I understand that in the specific medical condition may play a role in this. So we can't really say based on, you know, cause we don't know what that condition is really, but 
it to me it always came down to the old like am i worried that something is wrong or am i actually feeling an impairment right now whatever mm -hmm. that happens to be right mm -hmm. so whatever the condition is that causes that impairment am i feeling that impairment or i'm just worried that i might feel that impairment that tells you right then we have to put a, a break there between <laughs> thought and the action which like oh, i must run for help right now immediately if you can put that break in that's fine i mean i do understand also we have to acknowledge that some people have what may be life-threatening medical conditions that we do require a little bit more vigilance and more immediate action in which case you have to err on that side of safety but you know am i really impaired or do i just am i just worried that i might be there's a difference and i think as your your disordered anxiety improves your ability to judge that improves alongside also. It mm -hmm. seems to be almost universal. Like when you, you get over that fear so much, you get better at judging that. Hopefully that mm -hmm. makes a great answer. Um, anyone want to chime in on that? Every week in on my podcast, we do um, what we call the I did a hard thing segment where someone shares a hard thing they did. And I'll never forget one, which was somebody who said, they were panicking, but they had this additional symptom. And so they drove all the way to the ER. They sat in their car outside the ER and they had the, a talking to themselves. And they said, okay, you can go in if you want, but let's get really clear on why. Are you going in to get certainty or are you going in because you're met, you medically feel like you're in an emergency, right? Like you're, you know, and she said, I sat there and I thought it through. And I had that really hard conversation with myself and got, came to the place was right here. If because I can sit in my car and have this conversation with myself is proof that all I'm trying to do is remove my doubt and remove my anxiety. So she got in the car and she drove home. And, and for me, I always think of that story as like being the best modeling of making choices based on uncertainty versus making choices on certainty. And I, I love the way that she handled that. That's really yeah, cool. if if only everyone who was in that situation, we'd have so many, we'd have a, a lot less waiting list, obviously in accident and emergency and things like that. But I just wanted to go on the, on the fact, Kim, that what do you think the reason is derived like in us to actually go to the extreme lengths of having to find that, certainty from a medical professional like like in a and e what drives us to to do these desperate things in their moments well i think what do we hear in the news the or you hear from your friend or on facebook from your friends like oh such a great relief we had a headache and we went in and it was we caught it in time and we hear these stories all the time right of like what these one in a million chances of stories and i think because we have those stories in the back of our head um it's so easy for our amygdala to it's like an easy win for your amygdala your amygdala is going to go you might be the one in one million Mm -hmm. This might be the time where you post on social media where you made the right call by going to the doctor on the right time. And I think that there is a, a her heroicism in that. And I also think that there is a, a, like a gamble in that in terms of like, maybe this is the one in one million and I should take this chance. It, that's a really, really good point you raised. And I'm just going back and thinking about a personal experience when I was going through a bout of health anxiety and I was um, really, really worried about twitching in my leg that was occurring. And again, <clears throat> I had to go to the doctors to find this reassurance because I was telling myself that story. I was telling myself, well, that other 33 year old guy who did, who when it went to the doctors with his twitching, that actually ended up being such and such for him. So do you know what I mean there is a possibility that it could be this and when you fuel that narrative I think it just heightens the anxiety and makes you want to crave that reassurance more yeah yeah right I had a, a situation that might might help to you know, give you a quick story here I had at one point um and it really is just from just abuse in the gym I get a thing where half of my hand can go numb like these two fingers and this half of my hand gets numb it's a it's a ulnar nerve entrapment it's from gripping barbells right and then when it happened to me it happened to me well into my recovery and i went to open a peanut butter jar and suddenly this part of half of my hand was numb and i couldn't grip the jar and interestingly if it had happened to me two years earlier i would have absolutely 
been beside myself, like thinking, should I call an ambulance or drive myself to the emergency room? Something <laughs> really wrong. And I would have jumped on like this very healthy person is clearly having a stroke. But at that stage in the game, I had that initial jolt of like, this isn't right. But I was able to like him, the story you told about the person who, who shared with you, I was able to stop for a second and say, okay, you know, I, nothing else is wrong. It's clearly just this part of my hand, which is probably a nerve or a muscle thing. Let's see what happens. And it, it did clear up a little bit, but that would have never happened two years earlier. So it does get better. And as crazy as it sounds, my ability to reason through that ulnar nerve entrapment came from getting out and driving around my neighborhood every day. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what enabled me to do that. So it right. can get better. The doubt did get better. Josh, what's the reason that an anxious mind that we do fixate on the, the heart disease, the cancers, the ALS, the strokes? Um, what's what what's few in that narrative i mean if you look at that me uh, the brain from a mechanism point of view that's one of the oldest mechanisms in our minds you know it's a really powerful helpful mechanism for our ancestors you know a lot of people talk about fight or flight you know and um, fighting bears and things like that but actually that wasn't key to our survival because we're rubbish at fighting bears and running away from bears we're <laughs> not stronger or faster than a bear so actually the acute fight or flight response is, is pretty rubbish what's really helpful was this other threat response that isn't really spoken about a lot uh i know they hammer it in mct which i like but it's like yeah you've got your adrenal anxious response but you've also got your cortisol anxious response and that is the mechanism that keeps you in meerkat mode which is just you know this 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 is a, an actual mechanism that you have it's where's the danger where's the danger now, for meerkats and our ancestors, how powerful is that? It's better to see a lion coming from a mile away than walk into it. It's better for a meerkat to see a predator hyena coming than just right casually it being there. It's a powerful mechanism that's supposed to be there. But you you know you could argue it's ninety nine percent redundant, really. You know, in our day to day lives. But it's Try still telling the meerkats that. Try <laughs> telling the meerkats that exactly. And so what happens is rather than scanning the horizon, <laughs> rather than uh, scanning the horizon for the dangers and stuff, what the brain does, and I actually talk about this in my second book, it's like three stages. It goes, don't buy my second book because the publisher did it, buy the other two. And uh, <laughs> what happens is it's, you, your threat response goes to three places. It goes, is there danger around me? No. Then the threat response goes internally. Am I ill? No. And then so the third place it goes is, well, maybe it's something in my head. Now, people with health anxiety will get stuck at the second place. So they'll go, well, maybe it is that twin. Maybe a, maybe it is those, that, is that headache. People with the first one is, mm, maybe that person is judging me over there. Maybe that person is going to attack me over there. People in the third one, usually people with OCD, like, well, it's none of that. It's none of that. So maybe this thought is the danger. Oh, shit, it is. This thought is the danger. And it's this three stages of this threat response. So we get caught in it, Dean, to answer your question. When you get stuck in any of those stages of the threat response, that monitoring response, which is like, is the danger there? Is the danger in here? Maybe it's in my thoughts. Recovery is when you can allow that scan process to go through all three stages, feel uncertain, and be like, whatever, and carry on. Mm -hmm. oh, what, even if it turns out to be a thing, I'll handle it. I can handle it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I want to highlight Sarah. She said it's ha so hard to tell yourself it's okay when the symptoms are so real and scary. And I think that, that that is the whole topic of what we're talking about today, right? Is you're, you're talking yourself through what you're going through and it does feel real and it does feel scary. And, and a big part of the work we're talking about today is, is not spending your time because it feels real and scary. I always say to my clients, like, don't go, don't try and say to yourself, it's not real. It's not real. It's not real. It's just anxiety. It's just anxiety. Like, or it's just OCD. Like if you're getting yourself stuck in that, you're, you're really hyper-focusing on trying to get certainty and that will usually create anxiety in and of itself. Um, so that's just something to think about. What you want to do is you want to let it feel real and you want to let it feel scary and go about your day anyway doing whatever it is that you're doing as best as you can that's that you can't tell yourself 
that it's just anxiety. You can you're only not going to talk yourself out of it. Show yourself. You have to behave your way out of it, not talk your way out of it. In fact, but, there was a book called Brain Lock, which was one of the first books for OCD. And the one, and it was a four step program, and it was revolutionary for people with OCD. But step number one was tell yourself this is just your OCD. And people started becoming compulsive with that very quickly. It's just my OCD. It's just my OCD. It's just my anxiety. It's just, and, and before, before we knew it, this really great resource kind of became problematic in lots of people's recovery because we got stuck in this idea that we could just talk ourselves out of it being anxiety or be, it being anxiety. Someone just put, isn't the reassurance a compulsion that keeps the OCD going? Yes, 1,000%. Which is which saying to yourself, it's just anxiety, it's just anxiety is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Drew, I don't know if you want to rate... Um, uh, answer the question that I just saw on the side. Uh, it was referring to something. Yeah, I think it's four or five up. Don't know if you can see it though. Yeah. It's, yeah. Which which one is it? Listening to the podcast. That no, a bit, a bit higher. Uh, commit to this one, Red Dog. Yes, what? I think Why so. Right, I'll put it on the screen. Let's see what it is. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Thank you, Dean. Um, no worries. Uh, hey guys, why is it so hard to commit to healing anxiety when Drew says this is what you need to do? I right? take the knowledge, then don't do anything about it. Okay, that's a good question, Red Dog. First of all, I love the name Red Dog, and uh, <laughs> I happen to have a Red Dog myself, so that's good. Um, I think why is it so hard to do that? Because this is going to be a very meta answer, but it's so hard to do that because it's so hard to do that. Like the knowledge that you've taken on is that you have to go directly into and lean into that fear and allow uncertainty and be afraid intentionally. So why is it so hard to take that action? Because it's really hard to take that action. It's really hard for any human being to intentionally put themselves in an uncomfortable situation, even though there might be some long-term benefit. We're creatures of short-term comfort and we don't want to do that. So don't beat yourself up over that. It's really common. This is really hard. Like we all work a long time. I'm, I'm sure the three of you guys would agree with me here. We work a long time to get to the point where we're like, okay, I, I, I just have to do it now. And then you get right up to the edge of that cliff before you make that leap of faith. And it is a leap of faith. So that's why it's so hard. You are certain that you, you shouldn't do these things. And we're asking you to do things that are very counterintuitive to that sort of survival mechanism. That's why it's hard because it's hard, which I know it sounds flippant, but it's true. But it's a beautiful day to do hard things. There it is go. a beautiful day. Well, it's a rainy day here, but it's still beautiful. The rain's still beautiful. Um, Josh, could you talk about how to approach the XD, uh, XD, uh, how to kind of say it, extensional, um, anxiety. One that comes with DPDR and your experience with it? Yeah. I... <laughs> So I think well, you, you do mention it here. as your first anxiety uh, I, I, love, I love this question. I love this question. Uh, I've heard it before, like, existential anxiety and, and the dissociation uh, come hand in hand, and that's what I say. If you've got a stomach bug and you're, and you're vomiting, would you want to be thinking about your favorite meal that you had? No, you wouldn't, because it would ruin it. it, it just it, There's no point in doing it. And what I say to people is that, Again, when I said before about how your brain's trying to look for reasons as to why you're anxious, when we feel dissociated, derealization, depersonalization, your threat response wants answers to existential questions, not your uh, intrigue, not your, not your reflective mind. Now, I used to, I love existential things. I remember this, and, and I remember this in particular because when I was younger, before my anxiety disorder, I used to sit there and be like, "This is great." You know, I, I can reflect, oh, look, we're on a revolving ball, revolving around the sun, going in, in, in a vast nothingness. What is the meaning of that? Whatever. And that was kind of a cool thing to think about. Thank you, an anxiety disorder and de derealization dissociation. That magnifies and amplified that into something, called, into a problem. And it actually became a, like a theme of my OCD. And I remember being in therapy, actually recalling myself going, Actually, I used to just enjoy thinking about these thoughts, like whatever. So that's when I knew it was an anxious problem, like like an OCD thing where you need the an <clears throat> the answer to the puzzle. My advice to you is that treat DP existential thinking whilst derealized and depersonalized as a compulsion. It is not 
going to help you get out of DPDR because what you actually need to do is feel a bit more grounded and actually feel here. And then if you want to think about things existentially, when you're calm and with clarity, do it. Because and I hear this all the time. Derealization, depersonalization and existential anxiety go hand in hand. Yeah, because when you feel detached from reality, your anxious response wants you to start questioning it. And that's a compulsion. So don't. But if you but there's a significant difference between that and actually reflecting on philosophically. Is it true in saying that the um, derealization is your body's response to um, trying to help you cope with too much anxiety and stress that's building up? I like so, a yeah. dissociation? Yeah. Can be. I think the thing to remember here, too, is that a lot of folks with um, derealization and depersonalization are depressed. And a symptom of depression is to question why we're on earth as well um what's the point of all of this so sometimes all three of those can collide um i know for myself when i had depersonalization and realization i was constantly questioning like what is the point of the world because it was really hard to be depersonalized all the time um and that was after really going and seeing a therapist they were able to say like that sounds like you're it was coming from a hopeless place not an existential place Really good. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important for us just to say as well at this stage that all the advice we give is for entertainment purposes. Um, it's not to replace therapy and it's educational. Um, and we really want to stress that because obviously we're talking about specific situations and anxiety symptoms. So Instagram is never there to replace therapy. We're just giving personal views from ourselves, from the therapy room, and education and science behind it. Good point. I, so I, I used to follow the anxiety guy. He said, yeah, yeah, that guy is obsessed with the vague notion of inner children. Healing what your inner child. On about? Like, that guy is not qualified. He is not a therapist. I don't even think he's got a coaching qualification. Didn't one of you guys do a live <laughs> with him? I don't know if it was Josh or Dre. I wouldn't do a live with him. I've got more integrity than that. So you, Dre. <laughs> No, we, I mean, he had asked at one point, but that's just because, as, as well, we don't have to get into that. That's all right. Uh, yeah, but that's to, fine. To, to conclude that story, their best friend. To conclude that, yeah. To conclude <laughs> He's that my story, best man at my wedding. I, they're, oh, my God. Imagine like, <laughs> everybody in the wedding. Now, nah, forget it. I'm not going to go down that road. But it, interestingly enough, some of the oldest episodes of my podcast, my podcast was originally called That Anxiety Guy. And he is the anxiety guy. And neither of uh, us had any idea that we existed. And we wound up sort of colliding a bit. And at first it was like, oh, no, we have the same message. And then it's like, no, we don't. Like, all you yeah, want to, yeah, you're just know, trying to no. heal people and sell the herbs that your girlfriend sells. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> just don't use us. So stick to, to, anyway. stick to tennis, Dennis. <laughs> the next question. Next question. <laughs> I often get um, anxiety and heart palpitations and actually um, chest pains. Does that mean that I should always um, put that down to anxiety and not get it checked for other medical conditions? Um, so I'll say from a clinical standpoint, if you were my patient, I would say go and get it checked out once. And then from there, we do not revisit it. Um, we don't, we're not here to say everything is anxiety and that you're to blow off your medical health. Um, but, but go to a doctor we've talked about this in previous recovery rooms. I think that was when we were doing them on Instagram. Um, try to find yourself a doctor who's not going to give you a ton of reassurance and a ton of compulsive testing and so forth. Once you've done your test, it's done. Your, your job then is to practice writing waves of heart palpitations and writing waves of tight chest and all the feelings that you feel and get really good at willfully allowing that discomfort and tolerating that discomfort. Yeah. That was a thing oh, yeah. for me. PVCs. I used to get them all day long. Interestingly, I used to get PVCs all the time when I was like super anxious and gripped by anxiety because I was scanning for them all the time and they would terrify me and send me into two and three day spirals. And now I can still get them sometimes, but I can literally have them in the middle of a workout and they, they come and go and I just, so it can, you can do that. It wasn't easy, but you can do that. Uh, next question, guys. Uh, with the compelling science that's come out um, recently, 
Um, can we put an end to the debate that um, gut health and brain health are linked? Oh, God. Let me take this one, please. Go for it. <laughs> please. Okay. Here, this is a huge pet peeve of mine. Your have you seen? Have you seen the research? First I time? have. I have right. seen the research, and here's what the research. I read the. I actually read the papers. I don't read the synopsis. I don't read what they publish in HuffPo. I actually read <laughs> the papers, and here's what the research says. It's the research says that water is wet. So the research says that your your gastrointestinal system plays a key role in signaling to your brain. Do you know what it signals? It signals satiety, food cravings, hunger. It signals it signals those things. So the people who publish that research even say in the research itself, the first study that started the whole gut-brain connection thing, they would even say this does not imbue your gay GI system with executive function. It doesn't. So it just means that, yes, it signals some food and digestion-related things to your brain. Water is wet. Yes, that's true. It does not make your gut a second brain. And just because <laughs> serotonin is found in your gastrointestinal system does not mean that has anything to do with what's in your brain. Dre, oh, Dre, 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 what do you say to the, uh, and there's been some big, big um, sci um, psychologists, psychotherapists, sure. psychiatrists, yeah. Who are adamant on the relationship between <laughs> gut health and anxiety. If I am a carpenter, if I am a carpenter, I want everything to be a hammer and nail problem. That's what I say. And and you know what? I know there are a lot of psychiatrists out there that have made a a living for themselves outside of psychology, psychiatry as social media or mainstream media stars. And it's really easy to get people to say, oh, the gut, I have to, I have to eat more fermented foods. If I just eat more sauerkraut and kimchi, this will get fixed. But we also have a lot of research that shows that in populations where there are high fermented diets, it doesn't matter. There are no, there's no impact. Yeah. There's a really great book written by Joshua Woolrich. He's a doctor in the UK called Food is Not Medicine. Um, and it's all science-based and yeah. talking about the, it, and it, he does talk about how, yes, you can, eat well and that's important and all of the things but he breaks down these scientific co concepts really really well from a really level-headed place so that's where i would recommend people it's go. why we can't have nice things we have no scientific literacy on a large scale so one little thing gets grossly it's like the manifestation because of quantum mechanics same mm -hmm. thing like yes there's validity your gut does matter and you should be healthy but your gut is not your second brain and what you eat is not going to fix your agoraphobia it's just not well, that was my question. What is the question actually asking? Is it saying, it, is gut health a thing? Um, yeah, so I think there's some evidence that's come out recently linking that there's pathways from the gut that can raise anxiety in the brain uh, from, I don't I don't know, I'd have to look into the study, I'm not sure, yeah. but I think, I don't know how big the study is, but it's supposed to be one of the biggest studies that um, go in saying right. that there is a link between gut health and anxiety. <laughs> Where, um, where, I, where I struggle Josh, with what's that. What's Josh's opinion on this? Josh is staying quiet. When you, you know me, and I'm really passionate about um, who gets the credit. Yeah. So much so with anxiety disorders and OCD. Now, if I've had an anxiety-free day and I've been really courageous and I've lent into uncertainty and all that, then at the end of the day, I apportion that because I've eaten kimchi. <laughs> and liquefied greens and all the other shit food, then that isn't recovery for me. Recovery for me is I can wake up and have a full English breakfast. Then I can eat disgusting fast food. Then I can drink four pints and do what non-anxious me would do, which is, yeah, not healthy. And I'm sure, you know, it's, it's not great. It's nothing to do with my anxiety disorder. I think it's a lot of nonsense. Um, yeah, I just think it's crap. <laughs> just, but you know we should somebody mentioned acid reflux like look if you do have dietary problems you gotta you have to pay attention to those i'm not advocating four pints and donuts for breakfast but don't let drew put you off and don't let the acid <laughs> reflux put you off well that's, and I was that's, gonna... what, that's what rennies are made for just trash <laughs> them down and carry on <laughs> what i was gonna say is i think it's important that we also differentiate that sometimes and this was true for me is my first symptom of anxiety when I was in my 20s was my stomach. It would hurt. Mm. And as soon as my stomach hurt, 
I would get anxious about my stomach hurting. Well, I'm going to fart in public. Am I going to have this bloated in public? You know, what's going to happen? How am I going to handle it? Will I be able to stand up straight? And so we also have to recognize the relationship we have with fear about stomach aches and things like that and how that can play out. Again, the solution isn't, I believe me, I tried to do all the diet changes. When I'm anxious, my tummy will hurt. There's no food that will change that. Just just looking at the research, and I was just trying to do a little search while you guys were chatting, it does look like, from what I can see, it does look like the study was only in mice. Uh, so take that, uh, take from that what you yeah. want. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like, we take that, and look, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault, but that will get published in mainstream media sources, and I'm not the me media conspiracy guy, and they will say things like, Ooh, science says that your gut causes anxiety when it's a one tiny little narrow study studying one variable in mice. And like, if you can't be a critical consumer of the information, then we get duped into like buying probiotics for our agoraphobia. And that's not okay. <laughs> Probiotics in a general term. I, oh, yeah, I don't it's have fine. Yeah. No, I, if that if it makes you feel better, that's fine. I just hate to see this <laughs> stuff like, no, no, it's that it's anxiety. And I will say one more thing because I know I'm beating a dead horse, but as you can see, I get riled up over this. Yeah, go like, for it. You know, even so, are there signaling pathways that may, may be connected with anxiety? There may be signals sent from the GI tract to your brain that elicit responses and make you feel differently. But a zillion people have the same responses then. If that's true, that's fine. They're just not afraid of them, and we are. So tell me why that's a gut health problem. Drew, can we do a podcast where we just get really angry over shit? Oh, you <laughs> may, dude. You, you do your four clients. I got, I got burned in the closet, and we will let it rip. We will turn on the mics and go. I think we are a doing a podcast. I'm sorry. I, I know. I've been yeah. off, off on a tangent. Three hour now. podcast special on things that annoy us. <laughs> we'll have people call in. Just give us topics, and we'll we'll tell yeah. you why we hate them. Next week's yeah. topic, what pisses off the group. <laughs> So uh, I just put, before I even realize that I'm stressing, my stomach uh, starts to feel not. So you just mentioned that, didn't you, uh, Kim? Yeah, that is exactly me. Um, stomach aches is what started my eating disorder. I would get a stomach ache. I would then freak out about what it means. And then I would restrict food and change my diet which got me deeper and deeper into food restriction and deeper into more tummy aches. So that's really interesting. Um, I didn't know that was the start. Yeah. So I think we're running up to the uh, to the hour mark. I just want to leave it with one last question because I think it's a good question. And that's, is there any um, examples that you can give to me when leaning into anxiety or uncertainty isn't helpful? When leaning into it isn't helpful? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um when there's a possibility of, of actual danger so if you're in an abusive relationship and you're feeling uncertain whether or not you you know your 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 partner or whatever friend or whatever who has a history of being abusive that your brain will create a sense of uncertainty for you there but that's not uncertainty that you lean into that's uncertainty mm -hmm. that you heed the advice from any situations that has a potential to, to have a kind of harm you're allowed to kind of convene and get some other people's opinions on that particularly also mm -hmm. any if it's with health anxiety and stuff if you do have kind of developing symptoms and things um you know and also i was going to add before when we're talking about you know what if this is anxiety and more also you've got to realize you know if you've got chronic conditions um particularly adrenal deficiencies or diabetes <laughs> and things like that you do monitor for those symptoms because you've only got a certain window of it and okay th there could be fear there but you, you're going to have to have your own special kind of due diligence there where okay there's uncertainty here but i am allowed to do this checklist because it's for my health and it's not a compulsion so yeah there are elements of uncertainty that you don't lean into uh, and that's usually if there's like a history or you know that you know that there's an immediate threat so if it was a relationship, like you said, where the, there's issues like that in it, um, how, um, so instead of taking a um, exposure uh, route, 
uh, what other routes would there be for a person who's in that situation? Because we obviously talk a lot about exposure and leaning into uncertainty. So the people, like you said, that are in these abusive relationships, what sort of anger would they have to take just, just so they know? Well, that's where we thank our anxious response. That's why it's our friend. You know, yeah. anxiety is not a, this horrible, evil thing. You know, if you're in danger and you're being like abused and stuff, your anxiety is helping you. It's like saying, this is dangerous. Like, be prepared. Be hypervigilant. Keep keep yourself safe. Run away. Literally mm -hmm. heed the advice. Run away. Safety, like, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Fight or flight. No, don't fight. Run. You know, yeah. get away. Whatever that looks like. And that's anxiety yeah. being our protector. So anxiety is never always the bad thing. Um, but yeah, you know, and it's a great question. Is there any other times that we don't lean into uncertainty? Yeah, of course. Anxiety isn't just a trickster or a clown or a liar. You know, it's actually a, a great mechanism that we all need. But yeah, it's, it's, can I can I add one thing there? Yeah. Um, so I often use the motto, "It's a beautiful day to do hard things," and often I get emails from people saying. I have a feeling that I'm doing something wrong and they share how they start excessively exposing themselves to the fear in hope that that will take their fear away. That if I do it, if I expose myself over and over and over and again in this sort of rapid, urgent way, well, and then they'll email and say, it's not working for me. And so what I would say is it's a bad intention. If you're doing the exposure in effort to tolerate and be with anxiety or on the right track, but if you're doing it in an excessive way to, to eliminate fear from your life, it's probably going to become a compulsion. <coughs> uh, Drew, any final thoughts on uh leaning into uncertainty or exposure or well, mice I think, yeah i think no more mice i'm not gonna talk about the mice anymore <laughs> i'm done with that but uh i think what josh said is really important i actually did a podcast episode i don't know what number it is but if you go to my website and search for abusive i've done a couple with long island against domestic violence where we talked about abusive relationships and my buddy joe ryan has a tremendous trauma podcast he's been on a couple of times and we talked about <laughs> exposure is never because i've had people ask me that like how how do i expose myself to this person who is abusive to me you don't you don't mm -hmm. you know if i'm if you're unsure that that seedy looking guy in the van is not safe then you don't go toward that you don't have to be a daredevil this isn't about that so mm -hmm. um, yeah go yeah. check it out yeah uh just before we go i just saw another great question do you think adverse childhood experiences can cause ocd to develop later in life so there is there is some links to trauma, um, actual ex, you know childhood traumatic experiences to linking to it, but usually there's also a genetic factor that can be in impact as well. Think of it like a perfect storm. Um, and so yes, it can. Does that mean there's always trauma? Absolutely not. Um, and so I don't encourage people go seeking out what trauma caused it, but instead just to f target the symptoms. Great. Great answer. Uh, guys, thank you so much for turning up. Great answers as usual. Um, I think we're not, are we doing it next week? I think we're giving it a, a miss next week, but we'll be back the week after. Um, if you don't know where the other guys are on Instagram, we've got anxiety Josh at the bottom. We've got the dot anxious dot truth next to him and Kimberly Quinlan next to me. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys next in two weeks. Thank Happy you, Halloween. Dean, for hosting. It's wonderful. And I'll see you soon. Right. Thanks for hosting. Great job, Roll. as always. Roll the clip, right? Now I have to go yeah. into the other screen because I wasn't ready. So unprofessional. <laughs> I'm going to read some of my study. See you guys later. Happy Halloween. <laughs>